So many of you here, and uh, weather gods have also helped with a little bit of rain yesterday. So today, making a life versus making a living. So as usual, as usual, before we start, a small anecdote always helps. So this is about a young and bright IAS officer who is posted from his state to the centre. And he comes, you know, brimming with energy and wanting to do a lot of things and so on. And he joins office and he's working from 10 to 5 every day and slogging it out. He finishes files, they move on. Ek aur tatha files ka aajata hai. On and on and on. First week, second week, third week. He starts telling on it, he gets irritated. He, uh, it, it's affecting his health. So he says, what do I do? And he notices that in the same room, there is another officer sharing the room with him. There is a lot of The chap, I mean, pakoda, chai chal rahi hai, people are coming and going, and generally happy atmosphere and not a file on his table. So third week he picks up courage and he says, walks across to him and he says, you know, I've just come new. Can you just uh, sort of help me out? Uh, how do you manage this? So you know that big brotherly attitude, better yaar, samjhate hai. Kala dekho, this is an ocean. Hazaaron yaar pe clark hai. Sandro ab jais humare jaisi afsar hai. Kala in all this mahal, there must be a Mr. Sharma. To jo file aati hai, mein zikta, mein zikta, us pe lik deta ho Mr. Sharma for action. Or koi na koi bichara Sharma hoga ba. Nipat raho. There's a minute silence. Our man gets up. He says, excuse me, I am Mr. Sharma. <laughs> Sharma ji says, sorry. One more little girl is coming. Sharma ji owns a shop. He comes home. <laughs> 10 o'clock at night, he gets a phone call. Okay, okay. Sharma ji is saying, हाँ जी मैं शर्मा जी बोल रहा हूँ आपकी अंग्रेजी शराब की दुकान है जी हाँ अंग्रेजी शराब की दुकान है सुबह ने कितने बजे खुलती है ये दस बजे खुलती है नहीं थैंक यू थैंक यू बोलना इलेवन थर्टी एट नाइट शर्मा जी स्लीपिंग फोन बजता है शर्मा जी बोल रहे हैं कि हाँ मैं शर्मा जी बोल रहा हूँ गेटिंग लिटिल इरीटेटेड आपकी अंग्रेजी शराब की दुकान है जी हाँ अंग्रेजी शराब की दुकान है किस टाइम खुलती है जी दस बजे खुलती है 1.30 in the morning, there's a phone call. And this time, a slightly drunk chap is on the line. He says, Sharma ji, bol rahe? No, Sharma ji gets agitated. He says, I'm Sharma, I'm talking about my English shop. It's open at 10 o'clock in the morning. Why are you worried about it? He says, Sharma, I'm not worried about it. The problem is yours. I'm closed in your shop. Sharma ji says, Sharma, so on this happy note, we are really honoured to have a person of the eminence of uh, Dr. Gucharan uh, Das to come and speak to us. He's come here before and uh, spoken to the club members also. Uh, an alumni of uh, the Harvard University, he did his graduation uh, in philosophy and then went, to, went on to take his master's degree in uh, management, joined uh, Procter and Gamble where he was the CEO and managing director, and then 
took on to writing books. And uh, the beauty of his writing and his talk is that he delves into our old historical uh, masterpieces that we have, takes out the thought and philosophy of the Indians at that time, and weaves it beautifully into his talks and into his writings. He is also a management guru. And with these words, I'll hand you over to Dr. Gucharan Das to kindly address us on the subject of making a life versus making a living. He, he calls me a guru, management guru. And I just want to clarify that my idea of such a person is someone who is good at understanding, G-U, but relatively useless, R-U. <laughs> of course, the word guru is also in my name, but it wasn't always so. Until the age of three, I was actually called Ashok Kumar. My grandmother suspected that my mother, her daughter-in-law, had given me that name because she thought that my, her daughter-in-law was secretly in love with a Bollywood actor <laughs> named Ashok Kumar. <laughs> so this wasn't right for her. So she took me to her guru, placed me at his feet, and she told the guru, Enu Nadeo. And he looked at me, and he smiled, and I looked at him, and I smiled back. And of course, in India, in the West, everyone's called Tom, Dick, and Harry. But in India, people spend months thinking about the name of their children because they're prognosticating the child's future. And so, <clears throat> The guru said, okay, since you have placed me there, placed him there, let's call him Guru Charan Das. And so overnight, I was transformed from the prince of happiness, Ashok Kumar, to the humble servant of the feet of the guru, Guru Charan Das. And I suppose the guru was also sending me a message, message that this boy needed to be reminded every day about the virtues of humility. Of course, you know, now we've had a prime minister in the last 10 years who was very humble. But he turned out to be a flop. <laughs> and so the people of India have brought in, who was, he was not only humble, but he was one of the brightest, most intelligent, with the best academic credentials that any prime minister had. PhD from Oxford, taught at Cambridge, and so on. And so I think the Indian people have realized that more important than intelligence, more important than humility, is determination. So we have brought a leader with determination who we will do a better job of uh, ruling us. I'm going to ask, we begin, I begin by playing a thought game with you. And imagine you go to a doctor and you come back feeling very depressed because he has told you you have only three months to live. Now, this is a very sad way to begin this talk. But the question is, what will you do? What if you had, what if you had only three months to live? How would you live it? And, to, and because this is not an academic question, I'm going to ask you now to close your eyes for half a minute and think, what would you do if you had only three months to live? So let's take 30 seconds and think about it. 
and we'll come back to the answer. Okay, so 30 seconds are up. <clears throat> Open your eyes. And the question you should ask yourself, of course, first is, would you, would your life be any different, the life you imagined just now, from the life you're living today? And how will it be different? The purpose of this exercise was mainly to focus and bring home the point that we all want to live an examined, meaningful life. But the choices we make are always bad. We generally, to begin with, we generally Postpone this question. Kal soch lenge, agle mahine soch lenge, agle saal soch lenge. We are always thinking about that. And we keep postponing or we play safe. We are living a certain kind of life. Let's continue living it. It's quite easy to go on with the momentum as there is. And until it's too late, and one fine day, we wake up in, in middle age usually, and we ask ourselves, is this what life is all about? The problem actually begins in our childhood. When we start, we go to school, we come back from school, our parents say, how did you do in school? How many marks did you get? Did you pass the exam? And these are the questions that our parents used to ask us. These are the parents you ask your children and your grandchildren to now. What you don't ask is the right question, which is, what do you really want? What do you want to do? You know, none of us are born like Mozart. Mozart, at the age of three, knew that he was going to write music and he went on to become the greatest composer, certainly one of the greatest composers who wrote music. For most of us, finding what we really want to do is a hit and miss, trial and error process as we stumble through life. But it is a duty of a parent or a teacher to try to bring that out in a young person. Then we go to college and college we are encouraged by our parents to take useful subjects. What are useful subjects? Something that will get us a job afterwards, make a career afterwards, and so we are pushed to engineering or law or medicine or business. And especially as we are coming out of, of 40 years of license Raj up till 91, when there were very few jobs. So these insecurities were understandable. But now you, I find young people are more willing to take risks. And 
making a life has to do with taking some risks, not necessarily studying useful subjects in college. So after college, we get a job, we start working, we make a career, we get promoted in our jobs, we climb ladders at work, we get married, we have children, we get a house, a car, then a bigger house, a bigger car. And then we repeat the same process with our young, pushing them again with our middle class insecurities into studying useful subjects rather than something they would really like, rather than help them find a passion uh, in life. Until again one day we reach a point in our lives, usually in the late 40s or early 50s, when we come home tired after a hard day's work and we ask ourselves, is this what life is all about? Surely there must be more. I too ask this question, and so this is somewhat of an autobiographical question. I worked for a consumer product company in Bombay and then in other countries, and one evening, in my case it was an evening, I came home and I asked myself, how long can an adult male come to work? This was, I was working abroad at the headquarters of my company when I asked this question. How long can an adult come to work and look at the market shares, examine the market shares, of Tide detergent, Ariel detergent, Pantene shampoo, Oil of Olay, Gillette blades, Vicks Vaporub, Pampers, all good brands. But the question was, isn't there a life beyond this? And what is that life that is beyond it? There must be a whole world outside, as I told my wife. And she said, you're only having a midlife crisis. Stop moping around. Other people have the same problem. So get on with it. And she says, you'll be fine. The question that this existential crisis posed for me was the realization that we grow up knowing and being told about our duties to others, our families, our children, our parents, our spouses. But we are never really told that we also have a duty to ourselves. Now, very often, this kind of thinking turns people to religion. But I want to treat this as a secular problem, as a non-religious problem. And, and so, I say, so let's, let's go backward again. We go back to our childhood and in that childhood and in our youth, what if we had found a teacher or an aunt or a parent who had encouraged us to find something we really wanted to do, a passion? The reason I focus on this is because 
most people in the world do not like the work they do. So it's not unique, this problem. That is why we have restaurants, the success of a restaurant called Thank God It's Friday, TGIF. Or when we think about going back to work on Monday, we call it Blue Monday. And so really it's so important because so much of our life, eight, ten hours a day, goes into working. And if we don't enjoy our work, well, what's the point? Another eight hours goes into sleeping. So very little is left. And so a young man asked Freud, the psychologist, he said, he asked, Mr. Freud, tell me, what is the secret of happiness? And Freud said, very simple, to love the work you do and to love the person you live with. These are the two answers to happiness. There was nothing about God or anything in his answer. For others it may be. So therefore, it